So here we are having our live reenactment of being lost in translation. Um, that's going to be fun. It's going to be, you're going to be lost either way, whether it's Japanese, German, English, anyway, because today we're talking physics. And um, the physics behind sound as well. Is this thing on? Ah, hello. Um, give a big hand to our, our dear translators up in the booth. They will be guiding you. They're hiding behind that wall. That's why we kindly ask you to not go through that wall because um, it will be very painful to everyone else once a door opens. You'll always get a <laughs> And even though a <laughs> could be a good sound. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, it is a great honor to be in Japan and talking about these wonderful machineries that make wonderful sounds with two accomplished gentlemen of very different generations that have probably a lot of common. Please join me in welcoming um, Mr. Niki Nishijima-san and Mr. Takahashi-san. Hi. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry, there was actually too many misters, like son is mister already, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you both work at the same place, and speaking of cultural differences, um, folks back home would call this korok. How do you pronounce it properly? Korogu. 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 Right, so um, you can uh, just go home to your friends and now brag and tell them how, it's how, how to pronounce it properly. Yeah. So um, it is um, a bit of an interesting story, the way the company came together as well, right? So um, yeah. how did um, how did you actually end up working there? Maybe start with you. えっとですね。あの、私はあの、大学で電子工学やってました。それと同じように大学であの、音楽サークルであの、バンドをちょっとやってまして、かじってまして。その音楽と電子工学が一緒に活かせる仕事ということでコルクを選択しました。ということです。what okay. is a musical circle in university? えっとハードロックをやってました。Oh, so what uh, he, he looks like a hard rocker. Yeah? yeah, I mean, and, I, I and really the, admire the and boots. And the progressive so. rock. <laughs> progressive rock. Yeah. So what do, uh, what are your favorite progressive rock bands then? Yes. Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> and who else? King Crimson. Uh, so you're very much into the fidelity. ELP. Emma Sande Kan Pam. So you like big soundscapes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, and how did you get involved? Yes. Sorry, it's always a little hard to get used the to, the, to, to, to the latency in it. Um, if anyone has seen <laughs> um, Peter Amnett recently when he talked about his experiences at a German um, evening variety show, you will know the pain. Um, but um, we try to be to to do this as painlessly as possible. So, but always keep bear in mind that we need to have this extra little delay. And, yeah. So, so how did you yeah do yeah for me uh, I I joined um, Korg in um, late two thousand and six, um, and like Mr. Nishijima, I have a, a background in electrical engineering, um, not so much focused on sound. Uh, I did a general engineering course. Um, that included um, ele electrical stuff, um, and and I'd always been into um, actually even before getting into music, I was more into um, building circuits that that made sound, and I'd I'd been doing that for well since I was a kid actually, but um, I started to build stuff with sequencers and and oscillators and bit, stuff that was a bit more kind of more of a synth than, than some more kind of experimental kind of noise making stuff that I was doing before. And when I finished uni, I was, I didn't know what to do. So I was just bumming around for a year, um, you know, in, in Europe, um, 
building stuff. And then one day it kind of dawned on me that I should get a proper job. And I thought, well, why not Korg? You know, Korg has cool stuff. And I looked it up and, and Korg happened to be in Japan. And because I'm Japanese, I thought, well, what a great excuse to <coughs> move, move to Japan and, and, you know, get paid for doing this kind of thing. Um, I guess that is a very different situation than when you were getting involved there. Because um, a lot of the information when you started doing this was kind of available. But um, I guess you guys back then, I mean, this machine that you have in front of you, you did in, what, 1978? At that time, it was a lot more exploratory, uh, I believe, right? Hi, Kono MS 20. は、あの、1978年に発売されました。で、これ、ここに置いてあるのは、あの、昨年発表した復刻版です。あの、オリジナルの大きさはこっちなんですけれども、これをミニサイズにしたMS20mini が去年昨年 去年発売いたしました。で、これどちらも私があの関わってまして、これが私が会社に初めてあの入社して開発を任されて初めて製品化したのがこのオリジナルモデルです。で、この回路はあの基本的な回路は見えたっていう。うちのあの日本のシンセサイザーのパイオニアがいるんですか。それうちの会社まだあの毎日通ってきてます。その方が設計したい基本設計したやつを私がアレンジして、で生産工場で生産するために色々工夫を凝らしたのが製品です。でそ
時に忘れていいよって言ったらおかしいかな大学の勉強はこっちに置いといてこのソフトウェアを使ってこのハードウェアをいかに再現するかそれに挑戦してみようとそういうことからあの私たちが、えー、とアナログ回路をソフトウェアでシミュレートするとそれをあのコルグではパテ,パテントを出してまして CMT っていうコンポーネント、えー、モジュール、えー、テクニテクニ I think it's a component modeling コンうんそうそうテクノロジーそれを使いましてあのソフトウェア化したのがレガシーコレクションです As someone who has worked in both fields the software field and the very hands-on analog stuff I mean, it's, it's a debate that gets fiercely、Hi. held,、um, sometimes almost religiously. Like,、um, you've done both. What actually does sound better, and where are the pros and cons? Hi. Software is also used in the CPU, the computer. あのこれをソフトウェア化した時には性能が足りなかったんですですから現在の,、C、あのコンピューターを使うともっとよりいい音が出るんですがその私が開発した時点ではそれが限界でやっぱり今の時点ではアナログにかな,かなわないなとアナログの方が、えー、ときめ細かなことができますただしソフトウェアでやってももっとあのスピーコンピューターのスピードといいますか演算能力といいますかそれが極限まであの高くなればかなり近い音ができるということは思っていますただ今の時点ではまだまだコンピューターの性能が追いついてませんということですかね Okay, so、um, even considering the rapid increases in computing possibilities, it's still not good enough. Can you somehow explain in layman's terms what the actual difference is between an analog signal and a digital signal? I mean,、mm. or any of you? Okay. Well,、um, mm. if. Yeah, yeah, I was, was going to.、Um, if I could just. Show you the.、Uh, if you could switch the screen to my, to my Mac. Can you switch the screen? Yeah. Fade to black. <laughs> okay. Well, the good thing is we got engineers in the house.、So、<laughs> Oops. Okay. Let me start. Oh, apparently. Maybe Should I plug out and. Yeah, yeah. No? Okay, I'll do it. How about. In words? <laughs> Yeah, and you, you could probably use the GoPro form up there and just. Oh,、uh, okay. How about putting it like、okay. there? All right. Maybe. That's a bit, a bit roundabout, but yeah. I just did. Yeah. Sorry? 60 hertz. Oh, it's on 50. I'll put it to 60. Hey, brother. We are engineers.、Yeah. Okay. So, anyway,、um, so, so what is the difference between an analog and a,、uh, a digital synth? Is,、uh, the, the insides look quite different. And、uh, this is the circuit for, for the monotron, which is, which is this thing here. It's probably the, 
one of the most simplest uh, analog synths around. And <clears throat> basically, it's all about, um, it's all made from capacitors and resistors and transistors and diodes. FETs that's basically yeah. Do you have maybe four or five different components that that you use to make a synth? And for any part of this <coughs> of this circuit, I mean, for example, this is the VCO. It's what's a VCO? In VCO the makes makes the original the raw waveform. So if you can see, you know, that's that's the raw sound of a VCO um, that hasn't been modulated, um, and so. On this on this circuit, you see there's a com component called C11 um, that is basically charging up and then it's resetting, charging up and resetting, and you do that at a really fast rate, like you know 100 hertz or something, and then it becomes a tone and you can play music with that. So uh, an analog synth will will actually uh, create the the signal from currents and voltages, whereas a digital synth will create it from calculations at regular intervals in time. Why should I care as a musician where um, it it's from? It's, it's fundamentally different because um, in the digital domain, like I said, there, there are a finite number of calculations you can do. There's a, there's, a, you know, there's a minimum span you have between the intervals that you calculate, um, which will ultimately determine the resolution of the sound. So rather than having a signal that is completely defined during the whole cycle of the waveform, you will have discrete points that are joined by a line instead. So you can see there's a there's a finite resolution that you, you can work with in the digital domain. So it's a little bit like, I don't know, a wave instead of a step or stairs or something. Yeah, well well the staircase, you know, it's it's often portrayed that way, but it's not. It's actually a set of dots that's joined by a line that's allowed it within the bandwidth. It's not as bad as having like these square steps. Um, but yeah, you can see because you have a finite number of dots, you are losing resolution there. But um, I don't think that necessarily means that you get um, a really bad waveform because the human ear can, you know, at best hear up to 20 kilohertz. So I think um, for me, what makes analog sense um, special, um, although I'm not an analog purist, is is the fact that in the when you're working with software you can get rid of problems very easily like you know uh, dc cutoffs and you have other problems as well but i think in analog sense you have more problems that you have to find workarounds to and you have these kind of inadequacies and these kind of little quirks in the circuit that in the end give give the product character and th this is why if you go back 30 years you look at the analog synths they all sound completely different because they all had different quirks in the, in, in the circuits that that made them sound the way they, they do so in a way it's more like um, us as human beings having little quirks that ideally yeah, make yeah, us yeah. a little bit more charming yeah 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 absolutely so um, I guess it's a question that's that a lot of people are worried about these days is like um, at which degree will the calculation be fast enough so that um, artificial intelligence actually surpasses what we can do <laughs> as humans? Um, I, I think it's, you know, this, this AI thing is, is, is really, are we going to go on that? <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's really cool. But, um, but you know, it's, there's, I think it's interesting because there is an analogy between how much processing power do you need to actually um, <coughs> make something that feels human and and there's a similar question in, in synthesis. How much power do you need to, to make a synthesizer that, that's really quite organic, like an analog one? And I think, I think we're still quite far off, to be, to be quite honest. And bizarrely enough, a lot of the machines were used for their robotic quality mm. at the same time. So yeah, you yeah. got a triple loop of head fuck, basically. Like you, you want the machinery, but the, yeah, want yeah, the machinery yeah. to be humanoid. Right, and right, right. Then, and then it's really interesting. I, d I don't know if I should be talking about this, but because it's not to do with Korg, but oh, it is kind of. We just released a product called the Miku Stomp. You play a guitar and Vocaloid sings it for you. Do you, do you guys know Vocaloid? I yeah? guess you, it might be nice to explain what Vocaloid is to everyone. Vocaloid is, is a technology uh, developed by Yamaha uh, and a lab um, that synthesizes the voice. 
so you can um, you can you can play someone singing basically a, a synthetic voice singing um, and I went to the lab where they where they were um, researching this and it was really interesting because um, if you've ever heard Miku uh, she does not sound real but now the technology is there to make it really real that you can't really tell the difference between a real voice and the synthesized voice and 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 it's it's not good because it's too real. So there's always that paradox between, you know, um, we've got a machine, we want to make it more organic, we want to make it more real, we want to make it more kind of from the heart, but then it still kind of needs to be a machine for it to be cool. It's kind of, it's a paradox that we always have to work with, I think. Um, the other paradox is, as you mentioned before, the human ears capabilities and also what we can hear after eight hours in a club and um, right, right. and after having been to clubs for 20 years or so like there's only so little that's left that we can <laughs> hear i guess so um um are a lot of these discussions more a fetish than an actual scientific discussion <laughs> で、on that note, when you entered Korogu and um, there were other. That's <laughs> really <laughs> good. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm trying. We, we had some good teachers last night, I guess. Yeah. Was, um, the. Um, there were other machines already, like the 3100, or there's other parts of the MS series, like a 10 or the 50. Um, where do you say, like, oh, that's me. Like, this is what I bring to this machine, and that's what makes it different to any of the others. synthesizer <laughs> 人の、使ったりしてるんですが、それをユーザーが一番喜ぶような使い方。喜喜べれるような機械。単純なあの電気屋さんが作ったんじゃなくて、やはりあの楽器楽器であるべき姿と言いますかね。あの、はっきり言ってあの
やればやるほどむず難しいところが出てくるんです。でこれはあの私もあの学生の頃からずっと電子回路に携わってますがまだまだわからないことがいっぱいあります。これ何十年もやっててまだこれを突きあの理解しようと思うとあちょっと難しい話になるんですが。トランジスタの中の量子,量子レベルあので、電子とか陽,陽子とか素粒子ですね、素粒子レベルにならないと、本当の動きっていうのが分かりません。で、私もあの物理学も割と好きな方なんで、その素粒子とかの世界も勉強してます。でそこへまで行っちゃうとあの半導体の物性ちょっと訳が難しいかなと思うんですがそこまでやってやっと音,音の正体が分かるんじゃないかと<笑>であの逆にですねそのアナログ回路をそういった素粒子レベル素粒子って訳せますかねそこまで行った時に連続ではなくなるんですね。あの階段になっ階段っていうか一箇所にとどまれなくてあの連続アナログも突き詰め微細なところまで行くと連続じゃなくて飛び飛びなんですねでデジタルは最初から飛び飛びなんですがでそれをアナログに近づけようとより細かく細かく細かく直線になるように連続になるようにそれ,それをやるためにはサンプリング周波数をもうメガヘルツ単位まで上げてで縦の解像度をまあ最低でも今はもう32ビットぐらいかなそこまでやってもまだ届かないんですねただ人間の耳にはかなりあの耳のいい人は分かると思いますが普通のあのこういった音楽関係じゃない人にとってはほとんど差が分からなくなる時代がすぐ来ると思います。I mean, there's the music business on the one side, and then there's the engineering business. And I guess a lot of people are just intimidated by the physicality of physics in, in the first place. But when you start reading up on physics,、um, you start to realize that it's Most of the times, can get to a level where it's almost like reading philosophy or religion. Yeah, almost, yeah, yeah, yeah.、Um, is there recommended reading stuff and、mm. ways to lose the fear of all that's in front of you?、Um, I don't, I don't think、um, ways, ways to lose the fear. I don't know.、Um, Listen to noise. Listen to noise. Yeah. So, so the, the perfect、um, example of.、Um, oh, actually, if you could switch the thing back to the overhead, please.、Um, so, the perfect example of how,、um, how physics makes sound is if you、uh, think about the way white noise is made inside an analog synth. And basically, you've got a semiconductor junction that doesn't. Usually conduct in, in the direction that you're applying the voltage in. But if you raise the voltage enough,、yeah. the energy level breaks through the barrier and you get a kind of, a, a kind of a, a storm of electrons bursting through the barrier. And it's called the avalanche effect. And I think、um, to kind of appreciate the physics, it's, it's quite a good thing to、uh, just sit down and、uh, listen to some white noise. So. so. That's,、uh, that's electrons. So you can actually imagine、electrons. these little particles like. I don't know, I think、so、that's. It's, <laughs> it's like rain. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's rain. rain is a collection of like, discrete drops falling at random intervals. And, and this is exactly、um, the parallel of that in, with electrons. So, when he's saying rain and using that as an example,、um, 
they're scientists who try to design train stations and in a way to um, organize the people flow during rush hour, they would look at uh, how water behaves in a creek when it hits a stone. Right, right, right. So do you have similar analogies for when you're shaping sounds? Um, well, the water, water analogy is always, uh, always, always there in, in electronics. It's, um, you know, you have a power supply and you have resistance in the wires and the thicker the, the, the pipe, the more, the lesser resistance, so you've got more current going through it. Um, the water analogy is, is very much a thing that, you know, we, we start with when we, we start to learn electronics. Um, I wanted to go back to the picture for a second. Um, when you say you're going down to the nitty gritty of it and um, the detail and how things behave, would you be able, for example, to look at something like this? And you go like, oh, I know who designed that. That's a, that's a cork circuit, isn't it? Um, yeah. It's part of the MS-20, no? Yeah. yeah. That was, I mean, oh, it was yeah. a good educated guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, actually. Um, it's, it, well, I guess that more from, from, the, from the way the symbols are styled and the way mm -hmm. the, the lines are drawn. Um, <laughs> but but yeah. Mr. Nishijima will be the first to tell you that yeah. The good circuits are drawn beautifully, yeah. um, because it's it's a you know it's part of the, the craftsmanship of of you know it's a representation of of what you have engineered, and um, and there was one very happy point um, a few years ago when 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 he said that my my schematics look really good and I was quite happy. About that. I guess that might deserve an extra round of applause. <laughs> So, それで私ちょっと what makes what makes the circuitry beautiful to you? えっとですね。あの、普通あの電子回路やってる人が見て回路が見分かると、あの線が曲がってなくてまっすぐ繋がり、最短距離で繋がってて回路、信号の流れが分かる。あの、音の流れですね。が分かるっていうのが美しい回
I think it's really good that the people were were getting really into, you know, getting you know it's it's so normal for a guitarist to change their pickup or to change their strings, and you know that's basically what what hacking is, and that's basically what making an instrument kind of personal is. Um, so I'm, I was really glad that when we put this out, people were really into hacking, you know, our gear. I mean, even the other stuff that we don't, we didn't release the schematics for. People are really getting into it and uh, doing interesting stuff. It's that's really a, nice. That's a pretty modern approach to just get your intellectual property out there and have other people deal with it. Sure, sure. I think I think it's great because, you know, at the beginning you mentioned, you know, I my my career started at a time where. You know, we have the internet, you know, you just probably Googled MS-20 schematic and you found that, um, you know, it's it's that easy to get all the information um, that was probably really treasured and kind of locked up in a safe somewhere, you know, a few decades ago. It's all out in the open now. So I thought, you know, it'd be good to, for us to just kind of, you know, acknowledge that and, and, and do it officially. Um, Shijima's son, where did you find your schematics and where did you learn about what other people did? Were there other people work where you go like oh that was beautifully done i want to do something like that えっとですね私がカイロズ最初インターネット上でカイロズを見て美しいと思ったのが今のMXRじゃなくて昔のMXR の カイロズがものすごくあのエレガントで、あとプロフェットファイブ、あれもすごいエレガントなカイロだと私は思いました。ですからそういうカイロズを見てそういうふうに感じるってことは、その設計者の思いが伝わってくるんですね。いい楽器
そうでない量産型のやつとは音が違うんですがこういったあの電子回路でもそういうことがあ,りあるんじゃないかなとこれもう何年もこういったものを作り続けてますがそれは確かにゴーストがいると思いますそれは科学的に説明できないですが確かにそういったものが存在するっていうのは僕は今思ってます。I mean, this notion of things being animated is very common in, in this culture here. And、um, at the same time, would you say that there, the machine has its own ghost or that there's a part of you or both? So, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. 持ってるんですが、やはり名前を付けたくなりますね。機械に。<笑>そのぐらい愛着持ってます。Yeah, I guess I know a lot of people who name their cars as well, so yeah, yeah it makes sense. So、um, if, if we have like a, like a, there's like the blackboard edition、um, of, of the MS20, which you can put on the wall, like, like it's a, Chagall or something.、Um, will, we, will we have a bit of your spirit then in, in our studio in that same way? Like, I said, when、um, there's the Blackboard edition of the MS20, they, they, I guess they did it for educational purposes. So when you have that on the wall, like it's a Chagall,、mm. is there the same artistry and you are in spirit there? With whoever works in that studio, then. So, so, this, ne? So, we must. Yeah, when, when, you, when you buy one of these, you know, buying a piece of machinery, you're buying part of his soul. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, a soul is a priceless thing. Yeah, and yeah. At,、uh, but Korogu is always about. Not creepy, is it? From. <laughs>、um, From what I gather, is always about making things affordable as well. Yeah. And because I mean, the MS20 when it came out was、um, nowhere near the price range of what competitors were. And the same with the, these machines that you design now.、Mm -hmm. um, I guess that is company philosophy to a degree, right? It is. I mean, it's, it's I mean, <coughs> I, I, don't, I didn't know at the time, but in, when I was,、uh, my reason for, for joining Korg was. Was because it was a company that provided you know, tons of accessibility for people who didn't have money、um, to gear to make music with. And it really kind of it was really driving the kind of the, you know, people making music in their bedrooms. And you know, it, it, was, you know, it, was, it was great. It was, you know, most of the gear I was using was, was by Korg. And, and,、um, and then after I, I, I joined the company, and if you Um, look at the schematics of the MS20, for example. You can see that philosophy in, in the actual circuit. You can see how they were.、Um, I, if it's still there, it's, this, is, this, is the,、uh, this is the same filter as the MS20. And it, I think this, this is a VCF that uses the, the fewest number of components ever, I think. Am I right?、Mm -hmm. I think I'm right.、Um, You know, you would never do this kind of thing,、um, you know, if normally. This filter is called Korg, which is a filter. This 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 is a filter. So, so yeah, so when, when I saw this and I saw all the other circuits, the VCA is similar as well. It uses one transistor for the. To alter the transconductors. And it's, it's, you know, it's, so, it's, quite,、um, it's quite an aggressive way to use these components.、Um, and at the same time as giving this distinctive sound, it was also very affordable to manufacture as well. So there was this kind of fine balance between、um, being cost conscious as well as finding something, a sound with identity, you know, and kind of delivering that together. So that's still around. and with, You know, all these new products that we're making as well. 
Um, at the same time, some people are saying that the filters now on the newer version of the MS20 Mini compared to the other ones sound different. Mm. And um, those discussions get really emotional very quickly yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and in the way they are held. So where do you sit, both you guys, on are they that different? And I think they should sound different, you know, the, the different components. Um, you know, the, you know each, each one is different. If we go back to, um, you know, the actual physics of the semiconductors, you know, not, you know, you're never going to get the same doping in two different pieces of silicon. You, there's always going to be differences. And I think, you know, embrace that. It's analog. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's the beauty of it all. Which is the other thing, like um, how much freedom do you actually have to steer what you're doing there? Because it's not like you're a wood carver or a stone carver and you rely on what other engineers have done and fabricated to a degree. Like, I guess you're not building your own conductors or, or right, semiconductors right. or and all that. So you rely on industrial pieces to yeah. create a new industrial piece. Right, that, that, that's correct. I mean, um, Okay, to, to make to make your own custom chip is, is a very expensive business. Uh, the the synth business, unfortunately, is not um, usually big enough to to merit uh, you know uh, dishing up a you know a custom chip where you can have complete control over everything. Um, so uh, we usually end up using <coughs> components that that are readily available, and and so we have. Um, the control we have is through choice mainly. If a component is made to, made to very uh, small tolerances, then we try to use that and try to make it work. On the intimidation factor, um, when folks first approach a machine like that, they see a lot of knobs, they see all these empty sockets, they see mm -hmm. the cables lying around. I guess we have a very unique opportunity to get a bit of an introduction of what those different sections do, mm. and which also probably help us to lose the inhibitions. But also, mm -hmm. I guess there's a lot of general mechanisms in there um, that you can apply to a lot of other tone generating devices. Okay. And um, so maybe it would be great if you could give us that sort of physics lessons for folks that were... Um, doing other stuff? I don't know, because um, I don't know how to kind of gear this. Like, who who has an analog synth? Yeah, so I think that's a fair few, maybe half. Yeah. yeah. So um, so okay, let's go kind of half deep, half entry. If that's let's start let's start entry level and then we can always spice it up later. Okay, okay, all right. Um, is this on? Yeah, so that's on already. All right, thanks. So um, if we could, can we? Switch? Yeah, thanks. So that was a noise. Nice. So I think I mentioned VCO earlier. The VCO is um, the section of the synth that will uh, create the the raw. Uh, waveforms that you will eventually um, work with and, and modulate to create a finer sound. So this is the real starting point. Um, I'm just going to pick... So that's a saw wave. Which looks really noisy. I don't know, it's picking up something there. But basically it's, called, it's a saw wave because it's, it's shaped like a sawtooth. And, and this is a, a very, um, an analog synth is actually, I think, 99% of analog synths um, start with the saw wave internally. And then from that, they process it inside to make the other, uh, the square waves and the triangle waves. So this is the saw wave. This is the triangle. And this is a square wave. And you can see it's it's not really square. It's got these kind of these slants to the uh, uh, to, to the tops, which is actually an artifact of uh, having a DC cut, and it's it's cutting some of the the lows, and it's making these kind of um, 
these slopes. But essentially, this is the sound. These are the three sounds that you'll usually um, come across in a, in a VCO. Um, I'll come back to waveform later, actually. No, no, I'll talk about the waveform now. Uh, yeah, I guess you can hear it. It's um, so the. This is quite quite a nice mellow, buzzy mellow. Quite rounded sound, whereas the square wave is a lot more hollow. And the triangle wave is is almost like a sine wave. It's got very very um, low amounts of harmonic. Um, what do content. we need to know about harmonics and overtones to understand this? Um, I'll talk about the filter first. Yeah, so. <laughs> Okay, so uh, basically they've got different harmonic content, and harmonic content is um, so if you um, if you have an, the note A, which is 440, you have these harmonics which are kind of at, at 880, and then <coughs> twice, uh, three times that, and four times that, and five times that, and at regular intervals you get these peaks um, depending on what waveform you you start with. So, and the next bit I'm going to talk about is the VCF. Um, the filter, so that the filter changes the harmonic content, and I'm gonna um, put it through a low pass filter, and I'm gonna change the cutoff so it brings down the the high end of the spectrum. So you can see immediately that the edges disappear when I when I turn the cutoff down. It rounds the signal. It takes away the the sharpness. And it's interesting how the the waveform actually looks sharp when it sounds sharp, and it looks round when it sounds round and, and kind of um, kind of warmer warmer tones. So, and I'm going to go back to the um, to the harmonic content of of the sawtooth. Um, in here you've got you've got an array of harmonics, like I said. Um, and you can pick each one up by using the filter's resonance. And the resonance actually um, emphasizes certain frequencies. So I'm gonna turn the resonance up. So that's emphasizing certain parts, certain um, harmonics. If I bring it right down, maybe I'll turn this down. If I turn it down, this, this is the fundamental. You're, you're almost just hearing a sine wave, which has no harmonic content. If I bring it up, that's, the, that's an octave higher. Can you hear the? higher octave. So this is the one. We've just added one octave higher, uh, a note that's an octave higher. If I go slightly, you hear there's, mm, there's a fifth there. What's that? Yeah, so that's a major third there. And you keep going up. And then above, about here, you get loads of dissonance. So the, the higher up you go, uh, the harmonic content is going to be more dissonant. It's not going to uh, match musically with the fundamental. So it's by turning, you know, it's by changing, it's by starting with a waveform that has lots of harmonics. And then by shaving off the ones you don't want, and then maybe adding some that you do want is how you work with synthesizers. And that, that's basically, you know, 90% of the story. If I, if I go to a square wave, it's going to have completely different harmonic content. So this is the fundamental. Uh, square wave hasn't got a second harmonic. Oh, it has got a second harmonic, sorry. No, it hasn't got one, sorry. <laughs> and it goes straight to the third one. Uh, 
actually, if I cut the low, can you hear it better? So the, the square wave has, hasn't got um, even all the harmonics, so it sounds completely different. So by changing the, what you start with, and then by working the, the filter, you can, you can create an array of, of different sounds. And that's, that's basically, you know, most of what you need to know about a synthesizer, actually. So if that's... So if that's 90% of the story, why all the other buttons? Um, <laughs> well, ma mainly because um, uh, you want to modulate. Um, what is the modulation things? in layman's terms? A modulation is, is just a change, basically. So if I... I'm, I'm actually modulating the cutoff frequency there with my finger, but instead of doing it with my finger, I can do it with uh, the LFO, which is the low, low frequency um, oscillator. So if I do that, which is the same as doing. But the LFO can go quite far, so it's quite cool if you want to do it. That kind of thing. Uh, the other folk can also work on the pitch. And yeah, so modulation. Um, How much of that do you think you actually need to know when you want to be a musician in the first place? I think because. Um, well, what I just talked about, I think it's important to know, but um, at the end of the day, it's about finding finding the sound that you want, you know. Um, it's, you, your ear is just so much more important than having the knowledge of, you know, where the harmonics lie. Um, you can figure that out just by listening to the sound. So, um, you know, if... <coughs> a lot of the times when you're working with, especially analog synths, where, where they have a very distinct and strong character, sometimes they don't sit well in the mix when you when you have other parts playing at the same time and it in that case it, you know just switch the waveform or just turn the turn the resonance down a bit and it's just from working with the sound that you want and then kind of just experimenting with um, with the knobs and just finding your way there is is what it's all about um, so that's the hardwired bit where does the patching come in uh, the, oh, this one. I have to switch it on. Okay, thanks. Um, the patching comes in if when uh, in this particular synth. Um, well, in fact, you don't have to do any patching at all if you want to. If you want, you know, to to make um, to do most of the synthesis that you uh, you usually get in a synth. Uh, if you want to do some, um, you know, uh, weird stuff like sample and hold and make really spacey um, sounds, then you maybe have to do some stuff that's um, a little bit, a um, little bit more kind of um, involved. <clears throat> I don't know if um, sample and hold, I guess, is something that to people who grew up after the sampler and was invented is always a bit confusing. Can oh, you okay. Explain? Uh, sample and hold is basically um, a way of uh, if you have a continuous signal and you apply sample and hold to it, it just stops the signal at regular intervals. So if you have a sine wave um, and you apply sample and hold to that, it will become like a stair staircase wave, um, which is quite cool for making spacey sounds. Should we do it? Yeah. Okay, so the so the most common uh, way of doing this. So we're plugging the uh, the pink noise into the sample and hold module, and we're clocking it with the with the LFO. Clocking meaning. Meaning the LFO is, is determining at what point, how regularly the, the signal is held still. And then the output of that 
it is going. Actually, can we can we see this? Can we yeah, yeah, maybe we could plug it into the. So instead of putting it into the pitch, we've we've put it into the cutoff. So so that was the sound of the computer. That that the computer actually never made. So I'm, I'm going to have to turn the sound off because I'm going to plug it into here. Um, if we look at the what we're starting with, we've got... This is um, pink noise. So, yeah, you guys can see it. So it's basically noise. Um, and we're plugging that into the sample and hold. And the output of the sample and hold looks like Looks like this. We can make that maybe a bit faster. So basically, the pink noise, which is you know all over the screen, has been stopped at regular intervals, and the voltage has been held still, and that has been plugged into the pitch and the cutoff to. Sounds good. Right. Um, <coughs> so um, I guess we can get a little deeper with that um, after afterwards as well because um, um, some of that stuff is around and ideally you might be around for a little bit so sure, if sure. folks want to get really deep into it this is a very good chance to um, do so um, we also wanted to touch briefly on those little machines that are here and that were not very available in a lot of the world because uh, they were flying off the shelves really of oh, the the Volkers yeah um, what was the reasoning there for for what for coming up with this or for um it's well if if you could go back to the, to the monotron where, which we released in uh uh 2010 um so this this was our you know our humble re-entry into the analog analog market it was an, an analog synth with five knobs um it actually sounded really good but um um, but it but it was really hard to play any kind of um, conventional music with. It was more of a sound twiddling kind of noise making. You know that kind of you know synth noodle fun. Um, so it was it was quite a conceptual um, and product that we kind of we threw out into the market to, to kind of see how people responded to it. And the response was, you know, that the people really liked messing about with synths and they liked analog synths. And they cared if the, the, the filter was 
came from whatever and they they knew about the ms20 filter and and it was um really eye-opening that to get such a positive reaction from from this product so this kind of spawned um the next product the, the mono tribe uh which which was kind of similar in in its kind of synthesis but had a sequencer in it so you could actually make loops with it it, it also had a drum machine which uh, mr nishijima made i did the synth section um so you could you could kind of make something that was a bit more like music you could make loops After that, um, so this was on, in 2011. On that note, I guess it's worth noting that Korogu yeah. actually started as a drum machine company. Yeah, yes, the the, the first product that we made was was the Donkomatic. Um, Donka because of be, because it's an automatic. It's it's the way it sounded. Um, <laughs> so Donka, Donka, Donka. Is that gonna play? This is a. Uh, um, so, so, so that, that was the, the late, uh, the founder of, of Korg, um, uh, Korg's voice. Um, and yeah, and it was, it was, I think it was the world's first, um, um, drum machine. What, I mean, it, it wasn't a, an MPC or anything of no. the sort. So what sort of drum machine was it? Where was it used? And what's probably the, the story behind um, the company coming into fruition? Um, I think, I think Mr. Nishijima should be more informed about that. Yes. <laughs> と、ですかね。ナイトクラブそれ、その仕方があの、人間の代わりに演奏してくれる機械を作ろうと。そうすると、あの、機械でそのて自分のユートリアってくれると。人間だとあの、気分が悪いとやってくれないと。で、機械は、あの、自分の思うがままになるん
複数台つないで鳴らしたっていうのがうちのシンセサイザーの、あのー、起源といいますか実験的にやったんですね何個,それは何個あったんでしたっけえっ、ー、とアコーディオンの鍵盤数<笑>何,何個でしたっけ40個とかでした、ね、40, 40個とかあのー、こう新37件のシンセサイザーなんですがそれを並べてその鍵盤,鍵,盤の鍵盤をアコーディオンでコントロールしたっていうそういったそういったのがあの昔逸話でありますでその 700S という700コルグ700でその回路を設計したのは今あのうちまだあのコルグの中で。働いてますあの三枝という、あのー、電子回路エンジニアなんですがその人が、あのー、MS20 に関わってて MS20 の基本回路はその三枝っていうのが考えてそれはあのー、MS20 を出す前にポリフォニックの PS シリーズっていうのがうちありました鍵盤の数だけ発信機をつけてでフィルターもつけて鍵盤44件かな44件の,あのポリ申請それは MS この MS20MS20 が出る前にありましたでそこから1音分を取り出してきたのがこいつですねモノ,モノフォニックにしたっていうのはでそれが基本になっててであとこのボルカにも昔の技術が生かされてまして、えー、とその先,先ほど申し上げた700コルグ700それのフィルター回路をそのまま使ってますこのボルカというのそれはこの MS20 とあの音あのフィルターの構成が違いますであのこのボルカの和音にとってあの馴染むフィルターがその当時の700に使ってたフィルター回路であってそれをあの高橋に僕が実験してたのを高橋がもう持っていったというか<笑><笑>盗まれたといいますかまだ実験中だったんですがえ昔はそ,のそれを実現するためにその半導体を一つ一つあの手作業で選別してたんですがあの特性を合わせるためにで最近はその選別作業っていうその半導体ダイオードなんですがそれをあの人間の手でいちいち測って分けるっていうのはできない時代になってしまいましてなぜかというと昔は個別部品で売ってたんですが今はテープの,あのちっちゃな部品でもうテープでつながってるんですねでそれを一つ一つ外してこの特性を測って選別なんかしてると、あのー、今度それを基板にハンダ付けするのができなくなっちゃう機械でできなくなっちゃうんででそれがその選別作業っていうのができなくてもあの昔の音が出せるような実験を僕がしてたんですでそれを高橋が見て「ああいい音ですね」ってそれでそれをあのそのまま使ったの使ってくれたのがこのボルカのフィルターです。Yeah, so, uh, <laughs>、um... So, yeah, the, the, the filter on, on the Montreal and the Montribe was derived from the, the MS20.、Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a fantastic sound that it has、um, for monophonic synths. But when I was working on the Volkers, I, was,、uh, I had from, the, from the, the beating that I should have three VCOs. And if you have three VCOs, you need, some, you need a filter that will kind of work with the, with the, kind of the harmonies more kind of like smoothly. And so I was just wondering about the office,、um, kind of thinking, had this filter problem in my mind. And Mr. Nishijima was working on this,、um, what we call a diode ladder filter. 
and because it was you know inherently quite a, a difficult um, circuit to manufacture for it to be stable um, you know he, he was doing some experiments uh, that would make it possible to do that and so I was you know it was like perfect timing I was looking for filter he had one that, that, that sounded great and and uh, we could we could put into production so came together and we had the vocals nice one um we also do have a machine in the house that's called the Monopoly, and you mentioned monophonic, polyphonic quite a bit. Uh, could you briefly explain, A, what that is, and B, um, why people should care about that particular machine and what's Mono fun with it? Monopoly. Uh, <coughs> Monopoly is not <laughs> 上に当たる人が設計した機種です。で、モノポリはあの、ま、あの、発信機が同時に4つの音が出ます。4音、4ポリっていうやつかね。でも本当あの、モノポリっていうものとポリを混ぜてモノポリっていう命名なんですが、本当のところは4、4VCOの、4VCOの、モノシンセサイザー、モノフォニック
and and it's got a sequence so so if or just I was doing that before before we came in um, so this is with one VCO that's with two VCOs like in the third one So th this is um, a synth for bass, basically. How much did you take a hint from a certain other bass machine there? Um, I <laughs> um, we need to call the lawyer. <laughs> I, I'm under a spell. I, I can't say it. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, you know, it's uh, there's yeah. a lot. There, there's a lot of, I guess, cross inspiration between all the different manufacturers and so on. And I guess there's like yeah, like it's, everyone's it's really following what everyone else is doing, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but I think um, um, it, it it needed. If you, if you look at because these three came out at the same time, it's it was really important that um, people got the message. So it was really important that um, <coughs> you know this had. For example, fewer knobs and like bigger, chunkier knobs, so it looked kind of like it was going to make a bass sound. Yeah. And we we made the inside to to make a bass sound. With this, this was more of a this is a paraphonic synth, but you can play um you know you play you know it's a it's a synth where you can do quite actually complicated things so it's you know it's a synth where you have you know lots of knobs you have lots of parameters you can work with you can um, motion sequence the parameters to create your loops and you know that's what we wanted to look like um, how beach. different would uh, uh, Kraftwerk's The Roboter sound if <laughs> instead of a stylophone they would have had that one? Um, how, how different would it be if, yeah. if they had this? Um, it's this kind <laughs> of similar interface, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, but I think the, the interface is similar, but the, the sound is completely quite different, I think. Um, this... Um, we didn't have, you know, a particular kind of image. We just kind of thought we'd do something a little bit different. So, and in a way, like the cost factor determined the aesthetics of it. In the end, I, I guess yeah, yeah, it yeah. looks like it was a brief, a conscious decision to make it as affordable as possible. In the end, yeah. So, so when we when we start, um, or when we uh, when we plan a, a new product, we you know, we, we start with things like, you know, how much is it going to cost? What is the size? Should it have a speaker? And should it, you know, how, how many knobs? And, and we kind of close in on, on, on how it can actually, you know, how we can actually make it happen. And, um, and so from the start, we were like, okay, we're going to use these knobs and they're going to be, they're going to all flash. So, so we don't have to have separate, you know, separate display to, to show what's going on. And, and, and also to use the same case, so so we can uh, um, so we can use the same mold for for all, all three products, and and things like that. It's cost is always um, a very very important part of, of of development, and and you know I I think I actually think it's quite liberating to be working under um, cost constraints because you know. Um, because you've you've you know like I said with analog circuits you always have problems that you need to find you know solutions to um, and in doing so on the way you find something else that's quite exciting um, and so it's the same with working with um, a low cost product is you need to find workarounds to um, you know to avoid using really expensive components and when you do that you kind of discover things that you wouldn't have if you had all the money in the world and at the end of it it becomes affordable you get lots of people to enjoy it and you know everyone's a winner <laughs>
What's with the drum section? Uh, with this, yeah. so uh, this is this is in a synth, but um, it's uh, it's a, it's a drum machine. So sorry. Oh. Something clipping on there. So you can see there that's that was if I could just catch it. Um, so the kick drum is basically, uh, you know, a, a pulse going into resonator, um, and it's very raw, and it's, you know, it's it's uh, it's you know the kick sound of you know of the of the 80s analog um, drum era, and you know it's this is basically based on um, a lot of the sounds at the time. And what's with the the newest edition over there. The newest one is is a bit of a funny one because it's not, it's actually not um, analog. It's it's more about um, about manipulating samples, um, and completely kind of actually you can really destroy a sample in this. It's oh I've already done that. So if I start from well if you start with this I can. I can see what's that. And I can maybe, you know, change the pitch. Or I can make it slice it, make it glitchy. And whatever I do, I can automate. So if I turn automation on. So it's it's really about um you know this this kind of thing you know changing the start point of a sample the, the end point and pitching up and down it was you know it's stuff that's been around for a while i mean it's the same with this you know this this has been around for decades but i think the whole point of the volkers is that you you kind of revisit them in a different format and you kind of um you know for example this isn't doing anything new but it is new but there is you know a newness to it which is that um for example everything has a knob and you can automate it you know that's that just completely changes the game so um, this is what we try to do when we kind of, um, you know, we borrow from the past and we, we put it in a different context, in a, in a different, you know, cultural setting and in a, in a different type of box and a different um, price setting. And it just makes it into something completely new. And there is something to be said for it to fit in a hand luggage and... Um uh, if you lose your bag, which sometimes happens to people that play yeah. at night, um, you don't need to worry about what, how to pay the rent for the rest sure, of the year sure, sure. or get insurance and all that. Yeah. Um, I guess there's no questions. Um, can we have a mic? Um, hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering to what extent are you interacting with musicians while making out the designs? Because um, this question occurred to me when we were talking about the human-machine interaction, but uh, what about the musician-machine interaction? So that was my question. Thank you. Um, it, it depends on the, on the product. Um, usually the, the musician um, thing comes in quite late when we, especially because, you know, um, when you're just talking, talking ideas and words, you're not actually, you know, you don't actually know what the product's going to feel like. So that's a very kind of dangerous point to, to involve a lot of different, you know, kinds of people. Um, but when we get a prototype that's working, um, and we're quite sure that, you know, it's got something there, when we're quite sure that it's gonna, um, it's good then we that's that's the point when we start going around musicians and asking for their opinions um it's always a difficult difficult balance between kind of 
um, being quite kind of flat about different, you know, various people's views on, on, on whether a product's good or not. But uh, yeah, we try to involve them as early as possible. And that for us is, is when we have, when we get prototypes ready. I thought it was interesting when you said that working with um, cost constraints um, was something you liked, but I also wondered what you would do if money was no object. You see, that, that's why um, having this constraint is really uh, liberating because uh, it's, uh, you know, if, if I had all, all the money in the world to make a new product, um, to be honest, I would have no, no idea what, <laughs> what I would do, um, which is, um, I don't know why that is. There, there must be some kind of, I don't know, what would you do? あの、好きなようにやっていい。いくらでもお金をかけていいって言われると、もう終わりがなくなるんで。もう物にならないと思います。あ、あ、やはりあのメーカーが作るものはコスト制限があってこそ、そのコストで、コストまでギリギリまであの機能をあの良くしようと。もうこれ以上やるとコストが上がっち
um, I can really, really, you know, um, I can really feel that when I design a, a circuit and it's meant to sound a certain way, you have a kind of, you know, an image of how it would sound as you're working in, on your CAD and, and doing the, the circuit and then you test it, you prototype it and then, you know, it, you know, if you're lucky, it works. Um, if you're really lucky, it sounds the way that you intended it to. Um, but most of the time it sounds different. And sometimes it sounds different in a good way, and sometimes it sounds different in a bad way. So in terms of accidental kind of discoveries, um, yeah, we, we get them all the time, but they're very incremental, I think. I don't think I've ever had a kind of, you know, short circuit something by mistake and discovered like a new way of synthesis. Or, you know, it's never been that, um, you know, that, that big, bigger discovery. I don't know if you've experienced something by accident. So this ne Tamatama no Koro Konoto Konoto Skuru to Kini Ano Kiban Tiu Ano P C B O Tskurun Desga Soreka Ano Machinate Sekke Sarete Nanka Wake no Wakarana Otoga de Tato. Soreo Nate Koyoto Diranoka Tiuno Sangute Tatokini Aratana Hakem Shakotoga Arimas. それはあの設計の意図とは反することなんですが思いもよらないあの自分設計者が絶対こういう設計しないと例えばあの規制概念規制概念にとらわれないであの設計されたときにそういう音が出るとあの、本当幕不思議なことがこの何十年もやってるとたまたま間違った時に例えばこのパッチパッチングもそうなんですがこれを接続が間違った時に普通あの電源は分かってる人にはやらないような繋ぎ方をした時に思いを思いがけない音